We are going to begin our discussion of magnetism with a few very simple experiments. The goal of these experiments is to build our foundation of what magnetism is based on what we can directly observe. So even if you think you have a good understanding of magnets, make sure that you think through each of these experiments and how we can really build a scientific model for magnetism based on these experiments. So the first experiment is to simply have a uh, little amount of water, right? So we have some water here. And we put a bar magnet here shown on a cork so that it's actually kind of free to move. It's free to float. And wherever you move that little cup to, however you rotate it, one side of your bar magnet is always going to point north. Now, you might say, well, yeah, it's called the north side of the magnet. But in this case, we're talking about the Earth. I'm bad at drawing the Earth, but something like that, that we're saying this is north. So we see that a bar magnet will always point north. And the reason that this is an interesting point to start from is that this is the fundamental component that allows a compass to work. So our experiment we see is that our little magnet always points north, and this is basically a compass. Now one way to think about what's going on is that the Earth itself is actually a magnet. And so while we haven't talked about interactions between magnets yet, that will be in a slide or two, what's actually happening here is that the Earth is a magnet, and it is interacting with the little magnet we have. Now, maybe you know about the magnetic field and the magnetic field lines of the Earth, and that's relevant here because we're going to develop that for magnets in general. But when you think about the magnetic field of the Earth, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about very soon. Now, one thing to note about the Earth is that we have geographic North Pole, which is what we rotate around, and the magnetic pole is actually at the south of the Earth. Oh dear. So that's going to be a little bit tricky to think through. I'm not going to give you a test question where I ask you to label what direction is north. But the way you can think about this, and again, we're going to talk about this very soon, is that north attracts to south. And so when we say we have the north pole of our little magnet, that's actually attracting to the quote unquote south pole in the Earth. So we're defining it based on what we have in our hand not based on what we have in the Earth. And obviously there isn't a giant bar magnet in the center of the Earth. This is a, a model. And later on in the class we'll have the tools where we can think more deeply about what's literally happening in the Earth rather than modeling it this way. So the point here is to recognize that a compass isn't working based on magic. A compass is working on interacting, uh, a compass is working based on interacting with the magnet that is the Earth. And all a compass is, is a little magnet that's free to rotate. So you can make a compass, effectively, out of a bar magnet that's free to rotate, such as the experiment we just did, or we can use compasses to basically be little magnets. So that's something we're going to consistently do. I've briefly alluded this um, to this already, but we can think about the attraction and repulsive repulsion of the different magnetic poles. So when I say the magnetic pole, I mean south versus north, and we just use the first letters as abbreviation. So when we have two poles that are the same, for instance, north and north, these are the same, you have a repulsive force. Both magnets are pushed away from one another. You can then infer that if you have south and north over here, south and north, that you will again have repulsive forces. On the other hand, if you have north with south, you have an attractive force. Now, the good news is that this is very similar to how it worked with charges, where opposite charges attract, in this case, opposite poles attract. So that's again why our little handheld magnet, the north, goes towards what we call north of the Earth, but we would actually say that, oh, what's inside the Earth must be a south pole for that to be created. So 
this has a pattern that's the same as charges, but keep in mind that these aren't charges. We're not talking about positive and negative charges right now. We're talking about bar magnets where we've labeled one side as north and the other side as south, based on how they rotate in our little bowls of water, forming little simple compasses. A simple follow-up experiment is to actually bring a bar magnet near our compass. And notice that our bar magnet we usually label north and south, but there's also two different colors. Our compass, we haven't explicitly labeled north and south, but we're again showing the two different um, colors. And note that if this side is being attracted to north, it must be south. If this side is being repulsed by north, it is also north. So we have this interaction and we can see that if I bring my north pole around and I start to, for instance, move this bar magnet over here, that this tip will swing around to always be pointing towards it due to that attractive force and having a pivot point at the center. If there wasn't a pivot point here, if it was free to do whatever it wanted, this little compass would jump over, but we're, we always imagine the compass rotating, so it can't just move over, it can only rotate. One interesting experiment is to take a magnet and cut it in half, and we frequently color it this way to say that, well, this half is north and this half is south, but really we are only using literally the ends when we're doing our experiments. But we could pretend that half of it's north, half of it's south, but when we cut it in half, we get two new magnets that each have a north and each have a south. What does not happen is a south, and a north. That is not what happens. We have north-south, north-south on each one. Now we don't usually do the experiment where we literally take a saw and cut it in half like this, but many permanent magnets are very fragile. And so certainly there's been many times that myself or someone else has dropped a bar magnet and it's broken, and you actually see this exact thing, that both parts of your broken magnet have an end that is north and an end that is south, and again you can determine the north and south based on seeing how this magnet interacts with other magnets, how it interacts with compasses, or how it would align itself with the Earth's magnetic field. Now I am assuming that at some point in your life you have played with magnets and learned about magnets in science class. Now when you learned about magnets in say second grade or fourth grade or whatever it was, probably all you did was pick some stuff up with it. You didn't probably do complicated calculus calculations like we're going to be doing pretty soon. So the thing to note about picking stuff up is that both the north side and the south side will attract certain materials, such as paper clips. Now most materials do not respond to magnets, so things that have an iron basis will respond to magnets, um, and so certain steel things will, that's why magnets stick to your fridge, but copper is not magnetic. Most metals are not magnetic, and all and or almost all non-metallic um, objects, I'm struggling to think of anything off the top of my head, are non-magnetic. So very few things interact with magnets. Iron or steel is kind of the only one. Now, again, what's important to note is that both north and south attract it. And here, if we think back to charges, you can think of this, um, you remember that polarization was an effect, that either a positive or a negative charge would have an attractive force towards a neutral object. And so it's kind of similar here, except that that polarization effect was true for everything. And now it's only true for certain materials. So, so that's uh, important to, to keep in mind. Lastly, and perhaps one of the most important things to keep in mind, because many students frequently mess this up, is that there's actually no interaction between stationary charges and magnets. So this picture in the book without words is not that much help. So you see, okay, there's some sort of lollipop at a magnet. Well, this lollipop is supposed to represent one of our charged spheres. For instance, a plastic or a rubber ball that we've rubbed with wool or felt or something like that. So there's a bunch of excess charge here, right? So think back to the first week of the class. These charges are just sitting there. We know that there's electric fields, right? If these are positive charges, then we have electric fields that are all pointing away like this, right? So this is, this is old stuff. 
However, there is no effect between these stationary charges and our magnet. If we flip it around and put the south side towards it, same thing. Now there's a tiny caveat here in that we know that a charge does exert an, a small force due to polarization on all objects. And a magnet is still an object. But there's no effect due to magnetism here, right? So there's no magnetic effect present here. This behaves as if it was a candy bar or a chunk of styrofoam or a chunk of plastic. But we don't see an attractive or a repulsive force. So keep in mind that even though we had two types of charges and two types of poles, our north and a south pole, we're not talking about the same thing and they don't actually interact uh, directly in this manner.